usually yeah. I have to start off this by saying don't believe anything you've just heard. Um, I was trying hard to think what I could actually speak about today and, and how I would set this up and found that there's a speech that's been distributed I think to everybody. Um, so we, we did a good job about this because I had to write a speech last night which didn't talk about the most important event of the year for the Irish Department of Finance, um, which is the return to the markets today. Um, because, of course, if I had left that out as information last night before we decided to, to, to release it, I would have been doing something. And worse still, I'm going to have to go through the whole speech today without actually having any guess as to how successful or otherwise this is, um, because that would be unfair to those people who are participating in, in the exercise even to the point where there was a suggestion made that I should talk for much, much longer to go past the 4.30 the date so that I could look at a text message and actually announce it. But I, I think we'll have another session later and I'll stay around. I think, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to come here today. The invitation when it came through this year, like, like last year, was one that, that certainly um, was very appealing to, to come and participate in, in, in a... In a a, a school of learning like this in, is the best way to describe it. Um, but it also drew attention in my own mind to the difference between this year and last year for Ireland um, in terms of the, where we've gotten to over the year. And I'll, I'll touch on some of that as we go through the speech as I then look forward. Because this time last year, all I seemed to be doing was spending all night in conference rooms um, with the rest of the staff in the department and the NTMA trying to actually find a way of stabilizing a hugely unstable position. And essentially, I think this was probably the weekend or just a long way from the weekend where we were stuck all night for a couple of nights actually trying to negotiate the sale of Bank of Ireland, which to me represented one of the, the big moments in terms of a change of the way the outside world started to look at Ireland last year. And it, it's great to sort of be there a year, a year later and actually thinking about holidays this year and sending all the rest of the staff off on holidays. I can see Robert down at the back there who's really anxious to get out and probably likely to leave early because he, he wants to get back to, to, to finish up the last couple of files before he heads away and leaves me in the office next week. But I, I think that this session and, and the others that go on, and I'm really sorry I couldn't have been here last night because I had wanted to come for the session last night. Um, but with preparations for today, it, was, it wasn't possible. Um, represent a huge opportunity for us to actually hear views of people from outside the Department of Finance. And there we just heard the, the outside view. I guess I'm supposed to give the inside view of, of the economy. And, and I, what, I, what is somewhat pleasing to find is while there are differences, and uh, I'll note some of them as we go through, there aren't that many, and, and, and that is helpful. But, but I, I think that... We, we have been trying to, to implement a lot of innovative policies over, over the course of the last number of years before I came to the department and we've continued through that and we still have more to go. And so it's absolutely critical that we have an engagement with people outside of the system to actually help us in terms of guiding us along that. Um, it would be impossible for me to, to stand here and not actually talk about one of the biggest challenges we face, which of course is, is in some respects outside of our own control, which is the Euro crisis. And of course there will be a session on that in, in a while, so I'm not going to dwell um, too much on it. Um, but, but we're reminded very clearly by the spike in, in, in rates in Spain and in Italy in the, last, in the last while, which are now trading at rates significantly, in the, particularly in the case of Spain, above Ireland at just how tense the, the situation is in, in, in the European markets and indeed the global markets and, and how we actually are in some ways, despite everything we do here in Ireland, also um, at, at risk to being blown off course by, by things that, that happen. Um, my own view, which is certainly one that, that have been, has been expressed uh, across Europe, is that if we want to solve the European crisis, it, it actually means we have to get to, back to a position where the debt of European countries is viewed by the markets as essentially riskless. And we have had some policies that have been issued around that, including the sort of the PSI announcements and everything else, which have, have, have broken that bond of trust between the markets and sovereign paper in Europe. And until such time as we get that back, I think we're going to find ourselves facing an uphill battle along the way. And, and I think the best manifestation 
and the way we can get across that is when we can actually finally see European countries themselves having unconditional trust in each other and in each other's debt markets. And we haven't seen that yet. Um, I think that often when I kind of look at these, what might, by Robert, uh, what might otherwise seem to be particularly um, difficult situations to analyze, and I guess sort of, you know, Dahi has mentioned some of my background, I try and return things back to simple, simple analogies to see, see where, where we might be going wrong. And I'll, let me try one on you, which I sort of, you know, used in, in the recent past. But if I have a friend who's looking to start a business, and he comes and says, I've got this brilliant idea, I need 100 grand to actually start this business. And, and luckily enough, he's talking in grands rather than in millions and billions, which is what we now have to do. Um, he goes to a bank, um, and we'll come back to banks lending later in, in the speech, but let's assume for the moment that banks do lend well. He goes to a bank, and he actually convinced the bank to give him 70,000. The bank's not going to give him all the money he needs, but that bank, representative of the markets, is going to give him 70. So he's missing 30. So he comes to me and he kind of convinces me, you know what, this is a great idea, I'll work all the time at it, will you give me the missing 30? You kind of think about it and you say, you know what, maybe it's worth it, this guy's a pretty smart guy, I, I, I'll go and do it. But imagine what would happen if I say to him, okay, I'll give you the 30, but I want my money back before the bank. Or I want, we'll only give you the 30 if I can have actually the first lien or collateral on the assets of the business. Or even worse still, imagine if I say to him, I'm only going to give you the 30, even though the bank's got to give you the money up front, I'm only going to give you my 30 every quarter, provided that you actually come into work and don't go running off to a European Championships with a big flag and stuff like that. Um, and I'm going to come in and check and see if you've done that. And after checking up on you every quarter, then I'll actually give you the 30 grand. Well, I think it doesn't take a genius to work out what the bank is going to say at that stage. It's going to say, well, you know what? We'll wait with our 70 grand until such time as your mate there has finally got enough trust in you to actually lend you the money up front. Um, and I think if you think about that, it's, uh, in that simple analogy, is, is a sort of a representation of a lot of what's going wrong in the way the European crisis is trying to deal with, 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 the, with the markets, which are representative of these banks, actually being asked to lend money to each of the various countries, while their partner countries are actually sitting there looking for, for conditions um, and various other things. Um, now, what does that mean when you actually start looking at Ireland? Um, and I think there's probably two things I can, I can draw out in that. The first thing is we have to be playing our part, and it's hugely important for us that we're restoring our reputation in, in European circles, because that allows us to not just simply take the policies that Europe have been giving us, but to actually play a much more pro proactive role in helping to frame the policies. No one knows better what a banking crisis is than the Irish sort of, you know, system at the moment and what you might do to actually um, help think about the policies for them. Um, and what we need to get to, and we're getting much, much closer to it than I would say we were last year, is a position where when we express views on these points based on, on this bitter experience that we've gone through, that we are actually listened to. Um, but what we need to do is actually convince the heads of state across Europe that what we need to do is actually find the solutions that build trust among European countries, unconditional trust, and then find ways of showing that trust to the outside markets. And, and I don't think people, to my mind, fully appreciated uh, in the heads of state announcement about Ireland. To me, there was a much more subtle but important change there, which is that we had just listened to some of the, 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 the speeches about virtuous countries uh, coming from Italy, coming from Spain in the week before that. And it was to me the first time that the European heads of state actually came out and said that for countries that are doing the right thing, we're prepared to do more to show that we trust them. And I think that that is a much, one of the most important parts of the actual announcements on, on that night in that for once there was a public acknowledgement by Europe of the willingness to actually do more for countries that are actually trying to help themselves. And we also saw on the same night the removal of the, the, the ESM difficulties in terms of wanting to have seniority relative to the market. So I think we're moving much closer 
towards a series of policies that might actually start to, 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 to unlock the situation if we continue on that, on that frame. What it also means, though, domestically for us here in Ireland is that tough and all as the, as the measures that we need to actually put in place are, we have to continue to do so relentlessly. We have to actually continue to, to confirm the trust that Europe and indeed now the markets are, are putting in the system here in Ireland and in the population of Ireland to actually sort out and help ourselves first and get ourselves back onto an economic and fiscal sustainability. In a sense, it's only out of that way that we will genuinely come out of the EU IMF program. And I think you can sometimes, when we look at the challenges ahead, it's very easy for us to forget just how far we travelled uh, along the way. Um, we refer to the, the fiscal adjustment, but there has been 25 billion of fiscal adjustment done in Ireland. We talk now in terms of another 3 billion in, in, the, years, in the years to come. Our spreads on the two-year papers in, in, in the markets, about 12 months last year, so in the middle of July, were 23%. They're now 4%, uh, which is what actually gave gave us courage to actually be able to go back into the markets and represents this sea change of, 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 of opinion change in the way that the external world is, is looking at Ireland. But one of the things we've been trying, and I guess in many ways the debate around the fiscal um, and stability pact recently actually brought that out, is this is not just all about austerity, and there we certainly agree with, with, with sort of the outside view of, of what's actually happening. To get this to work, it's all about growth. Um, it's all about getting the economy back growing and getting people back to work. And we've seen Ireland in, in a relatively small club of, of European countries actually showing growth last year of 1.4%. And I know it's small. Um, it happens to be double what we thought it was going to be, which shows that there was a particularly strong last quarter last year. Um, but, but it is a very important measure of the fact that things are moving in the right direction. But we haven't yet got there, and that's a very important point. We, we spend a lot more time now in the department looking at things on a comparative basis. And you can look at the, at the Irish uh, improvements on, on competitiveness, and we can see ourselves improving while Europe, European labour costs are going up by about 3% over this, over this uh, period we, we look at it, and ours has gone down so that net we come down by 22%. When you look at the Irish lack of competitiveness and what happened during the boom periods and you look at where we've gone back to, although we've made huge progress, when you compare that to other European countries like Germany, you actually see just how much more there is to be done. Uh, and we need to continue with the structural measures that we're taking into account. We need to continue looking at our pricing structures and everything in, in our economy as we go through to drive ourselves further through that. And I'll, I'll come back to, to competitiveness um, in, in the process of looking at what that's doing. But one of the reasons for that is that we have seen that drive a very commendable improvement in export growth in Ireland again. And I was going to try and put some slides, but we'll put them up on, um, with, with the speech later to just actually have some of those sort of, you know, seeing how much our export growth had gone down, how much it's recovering again, and why the competitivity of our, of our economy and our, and our workforce is, is so important in that, to the point where we now find, as has been mentioned, that we are once again a nation paying our way, exporting more than we're importing. I know that this, uh, some people say, well, that's because we're not buying imports as well. But we are actually not only seeing a reduction in imports, we're seeing some considerable growth in exports, notwithstanding the difficulties in, in the global economy. Um, I think it's probably the case that, that and, and Dahi mentioned that I've lived quite a, a lot of my time abroad, and, and therefore you can come back to Ireland and you can listen to the headlines and you can hear a lot of things said about multinational companies and foreign direct investment into Ireland. But what will actually really play a key part in our recovery is revitalizing the indigenous sector. Um, yesterday I had two meetings. What is actually great about this is that I now get to have meetings with real companies and things like that rather than just banks and, uh, and going to the Enterprise Ireland sort of breakfast and things like that to meet real companies and actually understand 
what's going wrong and why they can't grow and things like that. And, and yesterday I had some, some, um, a meeting with, with some representatives of indigenous manufacturing companies showing just how much indigenous manufacturing growth is going down in real manufacturing jobs and how we need to actually turn that around. I think they were actually very pleasantly surprised and I promise I didn't change the speech just because of the meeting. But to actually find that I would be talking about that, the need for, for policy attention to those areas as well as actually to, to just IDA efforts on, on foreign direct investment. We have had, and I don't think this is necessarily well known, but if you, if you go through um, Enterprise Ireland um, statistics and that, you'll see that their client companies which, of course, cut across just, not just manufacturing, but also software and other areas, actually achieved record levels of exports of over 15 billion last year, which is actually the highest ever annual export gain that the Enterprise Ireland have recorded in, in their actual companies. And that, to me, is phenomenal. In, 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 a, in a market where Ireland's reputation internationally was seriously under trouble, where other countries were struggling with, with, with generating growth. And in a way, it shows what is happening, and I think we'll see the same reflected to some extent in, Polar, in Portugal's numbers, is that small countries with nimble economies like ours can actually be more nimble than the big ones. And therefore, they can turn themselves into markets that aren't necessarily growing, and just by being smarter can win actually back uh, market share in those, in those countries. I mean, when I spend time down in France and you look on the shelves of French supermarkets and the rest, you don't see Irish products except for Kerrygold, which you see everywhere across Europe. Probably the best brand we have in Ireland in the, in the food sector. But you don't see the others because we have traditionally looked across the Irish Sea just to look at, at the UK markets and we've looked at, at the US um, in the same. The stats I was given yesterday for this was that there's about 140,000 people rely on their unemployment for their unemployment on those indigenous companies. And so when you actually do a multiplier effect on that, that's probably about 300,000 people in the, in the actual economy of Ireland that are relying upon these companies where we need to spend a huge amount of time actually making sure that our entire system is cutting out red tape for them, is, is actually supporting them with lending and, and finding a way that all of our agencies are actually working together to, to do that. I think Minister Bruton just announced this morning something like, something like 900 or over 900 jobs again for small companies that are actually being supported by Enterprise Ireland in terms of growth. And that's where there, there is a real, a real sort of, you know, sectoral boost for us if, if we can get that right. The other issue that I wanted to talk about, and I won't dwell on this too much because we've been talking about the labour market a lot, is actually the fact that we do have this structural unemployment problem which we need to solve. Um, it's good when you hear the outside world telling us that we've got a problem and we figure we've worked it out, we, we see it ourselves. But, but I think that one of the things that shocked me when I found out that we had, when I kind of think about unemployment, is that you can sometimes think that's an unmerciful mountain to actually climb uh, and to get over and that we kind of think back to, to the 80s and 90s. But in the mid-1990s, there were 1.2 million people employed in Ireland. We're now at 1.8 million. So we have a lot more people engaged in employment in Ireland. We have a lot more small companies potentially able to hire one more person or two more people or whatever. And so therefore, in effect, the solution, although still a, a huge problem, should actually be easier to find. We just need to brand Ireland properly. Uh, so that the rest of the world see what we're doing in terms of exporting and branded across the whole area. And I think you probably know that a huge part of that is this idea of creating a global innovation hub so that people look into Ireland and they see it as an innovative country, not just in terms of software, but in terms of the way we look at agricultural research and development, the way we look at manufacturing and everything else. We have a lot of underlying strengths. I mean, I won't go through these there. Everybody knows them. Um, but, but just some of the stats that come out when you think about it, we actually have the highest third level attainment among people in their early 30s in the EU. Um, that kind of translates into a very strong message of, of sort of people. We're ranked in the top 10 in the World Bank's ease of doing business, which I think from memory, and I might be wrong on this, puts us, I think, number one in the, in the, in the Eurozone area. Um, we have 29% of our exports are classified as high-tech exports. 
compared to a European average of something like 17%. And we've pretty much got our infrastructure built. Um, you know, when I was kind of driving up here, there are a choice of motorways now coming out of Dublin, which you certainly wouldn't have had if we were at this when we were coming up here in 1981. Um, and yet there are many dark clouds on the horizon, and we can't forget that. I was, however, very comforted by the fact that when I did up the speech and started to think about those, I came up with seven, and the outside world only thinks we have three. So, so, so therefore, the job is probably not as, as, as intensive as I think. But, but for those that we look at, at least, the global slowdown is obviously a big problem potentially for us in terms of the way we are an open economy exporting. The euro crisis, the structural unemployment area. We, however, worry about particularly the weakness in the domestic property market as well, and it is a focus for us particularly this year in, 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 the, in the, the department to try and figure out how we can get our construction industry actually back up even to the levels it should be, where it's fallen below levels. There are a lot of people in the construction industry that will never, ever again work in that industry in Ireland because we just can never support an industry as large as we had. But we are now, we would say, actually probably only running at about 50% of what the capacity of that industry should be. So there should be a, a capacity to get some of those people back, back to work in that area. We also have huge levels of personal indebtedness, and people will probably be aware of the amount of time we've spent in the last number of months trying to get through the new legislation on, on personal insolvency and to deal with the excess of debt. Um, we have, which is what was mentioned, a lack of confidence. We have huge spending levels. Um, so now I find myself in completely the opposite position last year where I was worried about deposits leaving the Irish banks. We now find ourselves with deposits in the retail sector completely stabilised but actually worrying about the impact of the fact that the growth in, in, in saving is actually really just a symptom of, of this real lack of confidence in, in the sector. And we have a lot of challenges still in our banking sector. We've stabilized it, and I will we'll come back to that a little bit later if I get time, just to talk about that towards the end. One of the things, though, to mention is, while we have seven and they have three, which I suppose is good, as I said, um, is, is it's also important just to touch a little bit on what's happening in the Department of Finance um, in terms of the way we've done it. People in this room probably um, haven't had time to, 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 to sort of, you know, read through our, all, every detail of the strategic plan that we announced, to much to my great disappointment. I'm not sure it's on the bestseller list here in Ireland. Uh, but, but one of the key points out of that is I want to move the Department from a period of ultimate crisis management, where everything was all about the last bad piece of news on an email or on a letter, to actually having some of the people in the department continuing to focus on the crisis, because it is an important part of what we have to do, and entirely different teams focusing on the longer, the medium to long term. And, and, and next Monday, we go through the, 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 the last round, I hope, of the interviewing for the new head of ec chief economist of the department, who will build a team to allow us to actually develop a blueprint for the economy for the next 12 or 14 years. And I'll come back to how we're going to do that. But we also want to become what I've referred to as sort of an idea sponge. Um, we can't come up with all the ideas ourselves in the department. We have to create a department that is capable of receiving ideas, figuring out which of them are completely crazy, which of them actually make some sense, and trying to find a way to, 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 get those, to get those into there. Once we get that team going, the way we're going to do this is the Irish economy, as far as I'm concerned, is luckily enough small enough that unlike the United States or the UK, which are just laws of averages and things like that, you can actually take the Irish economy and dissect it and look at it sector by sector. And what we do is we look at each individual sector, and some sectors have already been very well done. For example, the Department of Agriculture is an example I use all the time with the Harvest 2020. They have a very good plan looking out to that. We need to, in effect, work with the departments to see the same across every sector of the economy. And then our job will be to pull that all back together again. And hopefully when we start adding one and one, we'll get three every so often, and we'll see synergies between it. But from then on, what we will have is we will have each department working to that plan. And everybody should know what they're actually achieving and where they're trying to go. Last year, you'll have seen a, a kind of a mini version of that where we took agriculture and we took tourism as two sectors 
that were, to our mind, actually key, and we tried to do some sort of minor tweaks on, on how we actually look at those and how we support them. And there we're seeing the results already. We've seen visitor numbers to Ireland up by about 10%. They're up by double-digit numbers in some European countries, which again shows that we move into new markets, we actually do it. We got a bit of relatively cheap but very effective publicity by convincing the Queen of England and the President of the United States to come in the same week, uh, which was very helpful. Uh, but there are now, we think, about 8,500 more people employed in tourism jobs in the first six months of this year compared to last year. So it is actually happening, and it shows you can tweak these sectors. And what's best about these two sectors, agriculture and tourism, is of course it represents wealth distribution across the country and economic activity because it's not just foreign direct investment that wants to be set up in large urban areas. Um, this year we're going to be doing other things and we have to, got to listen to ideas. One of the great ideas I heard and I think in, in a county like Donegal that's hoping to be in, 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 in an All-Ireland final in September. Um, you'll understand and be very focused on, on the fact that September has a lot of sporting events. The guy came up to me when I was delivering a similar speech in, in, in Berlin on St. Patrick's Day where we were explaining the Irish economy to, to Irish uh, people living in Berlin and to Germans that had an interest. He came up to me after and he says, what you should do in Ireland is actually designate September sports month. You have two All-Irelands, the Stowe races, I gather there's a golf tournament down here. The 1st of September this year, actually, we start with a huge American football game in Dublin between Notre Dame and Navy. And we should do that for next year and actually plan it properly this year. So, of course, intrigued as I am, I come back to Dublin. I try and figure out for this speech how many actual sports events we have in Dublin this year in case I was out there thinking about it. Almost impossible to figure it out. There's nowhere on any of our tourist sites, nowhere on any of our sites where you can sort of tap in September, you know, Ireland, sports as a filter, and, and go around the country and see it. And, and for those countries like our Limerick who might not make it to the All-Ireland, uh, we at least have Munster playing a rugby match in, 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 in Limerick during September. But wh why wouldn't we have our GA teams actually doing matches? You know, there's lots of GA teams that won't be busy in September that could actually be doing matches for the... For, <laughs> Uh, we'll be doing matches for, 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 to make sure that the, the tourists aren't taking away all the All-Ireland tickets from, from those counties that really want to use them. Um, but it's really what we need to be doing as we think much smarter about how we kind of twist things around in, in terms of our, our economy. Um, I'm conscious that we're probably loads of questions here, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. The banking sector is one that I would like to just talk a little bit about, because there are some hard... Um, parts yet to play in the banking sector. We have stabilized the sector, but it's not working. It's not yet producing enough credit for, 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 for the, the industry that we need, and it's not necessarily over the, the trauma of the crisis. Um, outside of the banking sector, we're putting together a whole load of initiatives to produce funding for industry, ranging from the microfinance fund through with the NPRF into, into funds. But what we do need to see happen in the next couple of months, and it has started, I think you'll have seen some announcements by the banks, is we need to move our banks back to a position where they're profitable. Everyone in this room has invested significantly in these banks, and I think the one thing you probably want me to do is to start trying to get as much of that money back as I can from, from those banks if I can. And as it's a very simple way, you need the banks to be earning more money than they're spending. And it's a tough message, but what that's going to mean is that they are going to have to look hard at the pricing of all their loans. They're going to have to look at if they're really pricing them at economic levels. They're going to have to look at their cost base, which includes actually how much money they're giving out on deposit rates, which are frankly too high by international standards. And they're going to have to look at, which is even tougher, their actual fixed costs in terms of the number of people they employ, in terms of the number of branches that they have. And, and we've made it very clear to them that what they need to do is realize that we have banks now operating in 2012, not sort of 40 or 50 years ago. And if you think about the way Ireland works now, people, I mean, I drove through Mullingar today. I bet you there's a load of people in Mullingar. They go to Liffey Valley Shopping Centre to do their shopping now. They don't go to downtown Mullingar. And our banking sector needs to actually reflect that as well. Um, I think to just sum up, um, I mean, 
probably I'm always the optimist in every room anyway, so that's, that's maybe a good thing given, given, given my job. But I am hugely reassured by the amount of progress we've made in one year. And while that doesn't mean that we don't actually have significant challenges ahead, we, we have made a lot of progress, and I think if we keep pushing, we will actually make and continue to make very significant progress. And I will have well stopped by 4.30, but anyone wants to come up to me at 4.31, I'll probably be around um, to do it. When they wrote the speech for me in the department, um, they, they made reference to, to a song, and I thought it was actually appropriate that, that I still make it, which is Liam Riley gave a song called The Flight of the Earls uh, in the 1980s, which, of course, by then I was over in New York actually, actually working and, and sort of you know, doing what all Irish people do on a Friday and a Saturday night as you sort of you know, having a pint and listening to the jukebox, and you hear, of course, Liam Riley telling us that, that we were Ireland's best exports at the time. Um, we still have unacceptable levels of emigration in Ireland. And that's what all of this hard work is about. Um, what I want to get to is a point where we actually get to give everybody, and the young and the not so young, a choice as to whether they want to go away again. Um, I think now my mum has officially counted that I've emigrated from Ireland four times. Um, so the good news is that that's the way it should be. We should be encouraging our, our, our people to actually go and spend time abroad, and then they can come back when they feel ready to do it. And that's what all the hard work that we're up to is about. And I can only say one thing in, in sort of finishing is I can't overemphasize the commitment of the people that work with me in the, in the civil service to this end. It's the one thing that has really surprised me more than anything else coming in from the outside when you're used to hearing all these stories about hard work in the, in the private sector is the dedication of our people across the thing, across the system, to getting this right. Um, please continue to give us all the good ideas, because we don't have them all. Uh, we listen to the outside world from outside Ireland, but we also want to listen to ideas from inside. And, and I'm sure I'll hear loads of them in the next 10 or 15 minutes as well. Thank you very much.